tucked away in a leafy corner of Oxfordshire. There's a workshop where unloved and forgotten objects are given a new lease of life. Now, that looks brilliant. This is polished up beautifully. It looks good, doesn't it? Gary Wallace is a restoration and salvage dealer with a difference. What would you want for the whole thing? <laughs> in his hunt for the unexpected... Have we got those in a tent, have you? No, no. <laughs> ..he travels far and wide to buy abandoned objects with hidden potential. Well, what's this thing? That's amazing. Two and a half, and you've got to deal. All right, no problem. ..then reinvents and transforms them into one-of-a-kind marvels. Helping him are his band of skilled designers and craftspeople... ..who paint, cut, chisel and stitch to create masterpieces that are sought after by collectors the world over. I've got to get 12.50 for it. Thank you very much, Chris. All right. <laughs> yes, yes. We turn the impossible into the doable, basically. <laughs> We're the ultimate recyclers. <laughs> Welcome to the Restoration Workshop. At the workshop in Henley-on-Thames, for Gary's team, no two days are ever the same. Hi, Gary. Hello. Aha, good timing. Yeah, this is the uh, 1930s. The business, effectively, is sourcing the uh, unusual and the interesting, then transforming them into something for the modern lifestyle, and then, obviously, we try and sell them. To achieve that, I have to have the right people around me that understand the way I roll and know me well enough to know that everything's doable. Everyday items are being transformed. These actually came off a great big fireplace. I just thought I'd make great pair of lamps. Sold and sent out. I think it sounds like a cockerel with a sore throat. <laughs> <laughs> Today, Gary's just returned from an auction with what he hopes could be an historic and valuable treasure. Successful trip. <laughs> Indeed. I kind of bought this thing blind. <laughs> That's not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw it in an auction, looking at what I could see online, worth a punt. I haven't actually seen it in the flesh. Have you not? No. That's, yeah, that is ginormous blind. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things that don't come up very often. That's it. Loads of room. The one thing I can tell from the weight of it, you haven't bought an empty box. Right. Well, I just hope it's made it here in one piece. Oh, my God. Gary, that is absolutely incredible. It made it. <laughs> he bought this 18th century mirror without ever seeing it. A serious gamble for any dealer. But it's a risk Gary hopes will pay off. Hand carved from a mixture of lime and pine wood, it would likely have originally been gilded in gold leaf to enhance the intricate detail of its design. I'm kind of blown away by myself at the moment. <laughs> <I'm> so surprised. <laughs> it's clearly had some restoration. I mean, it would have been a, a, a very, very regal looking item. Over 40 odd years, it's been in a storage, and then the storage has to had to be cleared, and it's come on the market. So, very unusual for something like this to come on the market at all. Gary has had a tip off that means the mirror could be worth a whole lot more than he bought it for. If the information I found is correct, this once sat in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> oh, God. Wow. Oh, this is so royal provenance. Indeed. It's a serious item. If I'm correct, then uh, this could be really could be quite something. Don't think the Queen uh, wants it back. <laughs> well, I haven't broken the news to her yet, but... Um, <laughs> I'm just itching to look at the back of this frame. The front of this mirror may boast an intricate design, but it's the back where the really important details are. There we are. GRV, George V. BP, that's Buckingham Palace. Wow. 
There we are, on there as well, GRBP. We've got the original back and the original frame. This must be what you've dreamt of finding. It is. How often do you come across something as unusual as this? On a hunch, blind bid at an auction. Um, this is the first time. <laughs> <laughs> the markings on the mirror may match its auction description, but proving provenance is everything. With an item potentially this valuable, it's vital he backs up its history with evidence. What an amazing find. A great day for the antiques business. Absolutely unbelievable. As well as creating and reinventing the weird and the wonderful, Gary is a collector and dealer of all sorts of fine antiques and curios. And there's one subject that's always enthralled him. One of the first things I became interested in, even as a, a young child, was um, uh, military and all things related, really, from military history, the weapons, the uniforms, the regiments. From a very early age, I was collecting lead soldiers or um, toy guns. Gary's childhood passion for soldiering was fired by a source that couldn't have been closer to home. Being the son of a sergeant in the Grenadier Guards probably has installed a major influence, so it's kind of always been a bit of a passion of mine. Gary bought his latest purchase at auction for £250 and has asked his dad along to get a bit more insight into its provenance. Right, How are you doing, How are you Gary? Doing? You all right? Yeah. Nice to see you. Okay. Yeah. What you got there, then? Let's have a look at this. There's one of myself. Well, how does it make you feel to be part of that? Great honour. Once a guardsman, always a guardsman. The Grenadier Guards is one of the oldest and most iconic regiments in the British Army. Formed in 1656 by King Charles II, they've fought in all of the major wars in British history since. So when were you in? What was that? 1955 oh, I went oh, in. 55. Yeah, that's the very first squad at the Guards Depot. It's you there, isn't it? That's me. All these lads, I, I can all remember them all, individuals. Now yeah. I understand why, yeah. why every morning we went to school we had to have an inspection. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually found something that I think might be of interest to you. Really? Yeah. This drum. Oh, yes. Just happens to be, you might recognise that. Yeah. First Battalion. And, of course, the flaming grenade yeah. from the Grenadiers. The band and drums march at the head of the column of that regiment when it's on parade. The list of battles on its side gives an excellent indication of this gnarled drum's actual age. The last battle listed would have been the final battle fought by the regiment before the drum was made. Got Tangiers, 1680, Waterloo, there's your boat. Well, but here it got South Africa, 1890, look, you see. And what's the last one on this side? Modder River, South African War, yes. 1899. Well, so this is quite old. So there's no First World War battle on us on no, here. So no. it must be, I reckon it is a First World War it, drum. It is. And I shouldn't think there'd be too many of those around. No, now. So it's a rare thing. It certainly is. My plan is to get this restored. I want to keep the patina. I'm not yeah, going to overdo yeah, it because I love yeah. the way that it's all the faded colours. And, well, um, that's right. I think on this occasion, I'll leave yeah. it to the experts. I, I'm, I think so. Inside the drum, Gary's found a clue to the original makers. In there's a beautiful old label. Henry Potter and yeah. co, contractors to the war office. I Dean, should think so. they're still doing it where they would be. Yeah. yeah. And sure enough, Henry Potter and co still exist today. Founded in 1810, the company started as specialists in drums, fifes and bugles. It remained a family-run business until 1965, and today they're based in Aldershot in Surrey, where Gary and his dad are heading to meet George, whose father was an apprentice to the original founders. George. How are you? How, How are, you? are you? Good to meet you, mate. How Good. are you? Good. This is Sergeant Wallace. Pleasure. George. Grenadier Guards. Yeah. I found this. Good old Henry <laughs> Potter drum. Indeed. In terms of... Um, Restoring it, I actually like the, the fact that it's a bit beaten up. 
I wouldn't want to change any of this at all, and right. even where it's missing. The old heraldry. Yeah, I wouldn't, no, want, I wouldn't want to touch that. that. Yeah, just clean up, perhaps a re-varnish. Yeah. And obviously, it's got a skin missing. To preserve the aged look of the drum, George has some old calfskin vellum heads that he hopes might work as a replacement. We got an old tin bed. Yeah, I think that's the look, really. It'll sit well with that. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. yeah. Right, we'll put that on then. We can get that stripped down. Yeah. We'll take the rope off, polish up the back for you if you like. Yeah, that'll be nice. Yeah, we'll be able to see a lot more of the heraldry. Yes. You'll It'll look as it you should. You will see really. more of the top. Yeah. What sort of memories do you have at well, drumming? I had a good right hand, but my left hand <laughs> was a bit dubious. <laughs> so, ba -ba -bum, ba -ba 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 you know, so they quickly took me away from that. <laughs> to me, when I see something like this, it's history. It is. It's history, and, and that's it's, what we're it, trying to keep going. At, exactly. With yeah. The potters. Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave it in your very capable hands. No, I can't wait to see it in its uh, full glory. Right, come on in, Sergeant Wallace. Let's yeah, get a move on. Thank you, George. Thank you. Again. Left, right, left, right, left, right. <laughs> Restorer George is wasting no time getting to work on Gary's Grenadier Guard's drum, starting by removing the rope that holds it together. We've got to strip it right back down to the bare shell. It's one single rope. It's all got to go back together. I've just got to be careful that I don't scratch any of the heraldry work. I do like doing these types of restorations because there's plenty of history there and I'm, I'm here to keep the history going. There we go, now the rope's off. We can take the top hoop off. There's the bottom hoop. There we go, there is the bare shell. Only half of the drum is decorated with heraldry. The other half is brass and hidden from view when it's being played. So I'm just going to put some paper over the heraldry so we don't get any grease or anything from the polishing. I'm going to polish up the back. About do us. So now I've got to clean up and try and reveal the heraldry. We've got to take off the old coating that was on there before, the old lacquer, the old varnish, and get it looking a bit shinier. A combination of acetone, methylated spirit, and white spirit is used to gently clean the heraldry without causing any damage. Let's get the line going. Let's bring him back to life. So I'm trying to take the old varnish off, but there's a very fine line between taking the old varnish off of the gold flake. That's what I'm fighting with. We're not going to repaint because Gary wants he wants to keep it as original as he possibly can. We're getting there. This has done well to last 100 years. We're going to preserve it for another 100 years. With the heraldry brought back to life, George gives it a coat of clear lacquer to seal in the restoration. Really brought that colour out, hasn't it? Hopefully, Gary's happy anyway. Hey, Gary, back from another journey. Over at the workshop in Henley, Gary's next project is to reinvent an authentic piece of engineering that he bought from a helicopter museum for £50. How oh, could resist that? It's just got such great form. This tripod jack would originally have been used to hold up the tail end of a helicopter during maintenance and repair. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with it yet, but it's just a really cool thing, and it's obsolete now. It could make a really cool garden feature, but it's one of those things, it's got so many yes. options. It's obviously built for a purpose, and uh, we're going to give it another one. Gary has already got an idea of what he wants to transform this into, and after some brainstorming, his vision starts to take shape. It lends itself to be an amazing armillary sphere or sundial. Thought to have been invented by the ancient Greeks, the armillary sphere was created to represent a model of the universe, with the Earth at its center. The arrow through the middle of its interlocking rings casts a shadow to tell the time. 
Some of the classic ones are utilize a, a figure of Atlas supporting the world. That's the, the bracket that's already in place, and I'm going to utilize that and fabricate Atlas, surmount him on there, and then see how that can be fixed to the outer ring. Very often, it's a case of bringing together things that you had knocking around. That's why we never throw anything away around here. And I happen to find this numerical strip, which has come off an old armillary sphere. This would be a useful piece to incorporate into this design. Looking at the dimensions of the base, the top's going to have to be just short of a metre in diameter. I don't have the tools to be able to create this, so I need to go to a very clever blacksmith friend of mine. This is going to be something really quite special. Just a 20-minute drive from Gary's workshop is blacksmith David. Specialising in traditional blacksmithing with a contemporary twist, he's been creating masterpieces from metal for over 20 years. So he's the perfect choice to bring Gary's vision to life. Hello, Hello Gary. How are you doing? Yeah, very good, very good. I'm looking at this purely from a decorative okay. point of view, and I think this is visual impact we're looking at. That's nice, so we can just concentrate on making it look good. Yeah. Gary wants to incorporate the copper strip as a decorative feature within one of the rings of the armillary sphere. So we need to find some metal now that this can sit on happily. Yeah. If you had something that was close and we had to wrap it, I don't think that'd be a problem. We could just round these off and just create a feature of it, really. All right, that, that's a good idea. I like that. The first step is to create the three rings that will make up the sphere. This machine is known as a pyramid roller. The top wheel pinches the metal and deflects it, bending it into an arc as it passes along the wheels below and eventually into a perfect ring shape. You can really see it taking shape now, can't you? Done. That looks about right. Yeah, spot on. OK, so we're going to weld this. With the first ring finished, David has two more to make to complete the armillary sphere. That's going to work a treat. Before welding the rings together permanently, David checks the dimensions are spot on. So that's Atlas. That's, that's there, at that sort of angle. Yep. And we need the arrow coming up. But they're all effectively at right angles to each other. Yeah, brilliant. With the sphere taking shape, Gary works on creating the figure of the Greek god Atlas on a slab of steel. I'm trying to work out how I can get the scale correct to this radius. I'm liking that. In silhouette, it looks magnificent. You up for cutting it, then? Yeah, it's good. Yeah? It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite being in the restoration business for over 30 years, there's always a new skill to be learned. If you're going to pierce in there, you've got to cut at that angle and gradually bring it in until it cuts down. Slower. This plasma cutter works by compressed air being blown at high speed out of a nozzle. At the same time, an electrical arc is formed onto the surface being cut. This turns some of that compressed air into plasma, hot enough to melt the metal. Try and keep the movement smooth. You get a smoother cut. It's not long before Gary gets the hang of it. Quite satisfying, isn't it? Yeah, very much. Right. I quite like that. So, let's see what it looks like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'll work. Yeah, really pleased with that. The proportion looks right. He's quite buff. Yeah, he did to be. Look what he's holding up. Yeah. <laughs> While David finishes assembling the sphere, 
Gary smooths the edges on Atlas, who is nearly ready to hold up the world. Looking amazing, yeah. and yeah. Uh, <laughs> seeing it in that form now, it kind of it's it's coming to life very much. <laughs> I've learned some new skills today. I expected to sort of drop it off, do a drawing, and get, get on my way. And the next thing you know, I'm actually taking part um, in a blacksmith's. I was his apprentice for the day. Thoroughly enjoyed it. In Aldershot, having cleaned and revarnished the main body of the military drum, George is now ready to give it a new skin, which he's been soaking in water to allow it to soften. So now I have to tuck it around. So I pull it, push the tool in, around and under. It's adhering to itself. Now you go and do the opposites. So I'll spin it around. And there, let's get under. And when it dries, it shrinks slightly and then it'll be a lot tighter once it's on the drum. There we go. We're nearly there. Before he can reassemble the drum, George needs to retie the braces, which attach to the rope, and regulate the tension of the drum head. So I've got myself an old head that I can cut up, which I'm going to use for lace to retie the braces. Put them into soak, so then they soften up. Actually, this was my first job at Potters. At 14 years old, I used to get paid 34p each when I used to come home from school. I'm fresh. Using a mix of white powder, PVA and water, George can now re-whiten the rope and braces. Just making sure that we get it all inside the rope, all inside the twists. Once it's dry, it'll be ready for roping on the drum. All that's left is to reassemble the pieces. All the way through. And we bring our rope over the top, and back down through the brace. We carry this process on all the way around the drum. I can go round and tighten it up. To see how it was um, and to how it is now, I think it's a bit of a difference. Gary and his team hate to see anything useful or beautiful thrown on the scrappy. Today, he's going to reinvent the front grille of a 1930s Wolseley Hornet. These two-seater cars cost £175 and were aimed at society's elite. Their tiny but powerful engines developed an outstanding reputation. Gary wants to preserve this icon of British engineering as a bespoke wall mirror. Before I do anything, I've got to take this rather nasty dent out. So, um, go outside to the uh, dent removal department. What we need to do is try and force this back the other way and by placing it on this very strategically placed upturned table leg, it just happened to serve this purpose. Let's push that out quite well just by using sort of my body weight. Now, I'm just going to give it another little tap with the mallet. That nasty dent in the side has come out. There will be a mark there, but just part of its character. Using wire wool, he can now set to work on creating the distressed look that he's after. We don't need to go too far with it, because I do actually want to see an element of patina and wear. This grill would have been pressed from brass and then coated in, in uh, chrome. And sometimes you get the brass coming through, especially on areas where it's had a bit of damage. And we see traces just coming through on some of these edges and some of these little areas here. It's quite nice just to leave that. Let's go. I've uh, found a piece of timber that was actually a um, table leaf. So I've positioned it on this board. And I will now mark on here the, the contour I need to follow. And I will cut that off out by hand.
this backing board now becomes the template for my mirror. I'm going to cut a piece which is just slightly oversized, then lay my template on it, draw around the template, and then by hand cut the shape. Glass being glass, that could all go wrong at any stage. Once the straight cuts are made, he can start on the more tricky rounded edges. We're going to lubricate the wheel with, with white spirit because that's going to help it glide along. Because we're doing it by hand, we, we especially need this. So far, so good. Very pleased with the way that went. I'm just going to file down the edge. But at no point can you be complacent with this mirror plate because it could break at any point. And the only time it's really safe is once it's stuck to that board and in that casing there. To keep the mirror in place, I will use a clear silicon adhesive, the best stuff on the market, and it really does hold it there. Once it's in there, it's in there, and it's, it's not going anywhere. I'll just place the mirror on. A little bit of movement, just to make sure it's got the right tolerance all the way around, so we don't risk knocking it inside the shell. And then I'll let that set really hard. Silicon dry, it's time for the finishing touches. So what I want to do is spray this bottom edge black, which is just for presentation, and then this line becomes the sort of shining edge. It looks like it's slightly off the wall when you hang it. Uh, it's just a bit of an illusion, really. All I do now is a final polish up on the chrome and uh, just clean the glass, ready to go. From a 60-pound discarded car grill that no longer had a purpose, to a unique and contemporary design piece with mass appeal that Gary now hopes to sell for £250. Not bad for a day's work. <music> Gary has been doing his research into the provenance of the antique mirror he bought at an online auction. After contacting numerous sales rooms and auction houses, he's finally struck gold. I've got a cutting from the original auction catalogue, and it was sold in um, 1959 by Christie's. Now, the provenance listed here is King George V, 1936 Buckingham Palace. Well, that would explain the BP. Queen Mary, 1953, Marlborough House. She was well known for having a few bits shipped off to Marlborough. And Her Majesty the Queen actually sold the mirror as a pair, so there would have been two. The stamps I discovered on the back are confirmed from this provenance that um, it was King George V, GVR, and uh, uh, BP, Buckingham Palace, ties in exactly with this um, catalogue entry. This level of royal provenance could mean a hefty profit. It's really good news. I think we're onto a winner. I took a bit of a chance and uh, paid well into four figures for it. This could go well into five figures to the right punter. Every now and again, you do take a bit of a gamble on a hunch or a gut feeling. I was very lucky to, to have bought it. I'm not going to do an awful lot with it. Such an amazing piece. My gut feeling is, is paid off. The military drum Gary bought at auction has been fully restored and has just arrived back at the workshop. Stand by your beds. We have a delivery. Oh, interesting. <laughs> this will be the unveiling, because I haven't seen it either. All right. Aha. Uh -huh. That's a bit like Christmas, isn't it? It certainly is, yeah. You have to say, just what I wanted, Dad. 
<laughs> Apple and orange. <laughs> Looking good. Well, look at that. Yes. Oh, that looks, looks a bit He's different, doesn't it? Done a good job, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They very nicely, not tampered with the original paint over work. the top no just no. sealed it in and preserved it <clears throat> that's a great job isn't it nice bit of history that we were trying to sort out exactly the year weren't we yeah look 1914 what i might do is uh rather than just sit on a shelf is uh create a uh, a drum table yeah so i'm not going to tamper with the drum at all i'm literally going to create a base yeah. and then uh, have a nice glass top that way, this stays as an original piece. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. It's yeah. just that's almost a, it's almost a, a presentation place for it. It really is, yeah. And uh, yeah. Also, and we've created it the right height so we can actually yeah. use it to put a, a cup of coffee. I don't think you'll find another one. He's done a magnificent job with it. Yeah, it's really nice. With a plan up his sleeve, Gary gets to work on creating a base for the drum to stand on. I selected a. A really nice piece of chunky teak, which uh, will polish up beautifully. Gary gets out his trusty router to give the sides of the wood some decorative detail. As you can see, we have the a step there and then a lovely rounded edge and that's exactly what we're looking for in this particular case. Gary uses a dark wax to stain the wooden base and blend it to the colour of the drum. As you can see, the, um, the wax is having quite a dramatic effect on the, uh, the wood. It's actually doing exactly as I kind of intended. That's really now getting a really nice rich colour now. Now he can give it the all-important test. What I'm going to do is improvise by creating an insert that this sits on and then gives it a little bit of space to raise it slightly and that will allow the ropes to sit on this stand. I'm going to take a template of underneath and uh, cut a section of timber that this can sit on. That'll be sanded, waxed, polished and screwed to the base. So I'm going to put this little layer of felt. So I'm going to glue that onto there, and that'll just sit there really nicely and protect it. Now we're ready to place the drum. The item could be detached at any time and played if you wish. Be a fantastic talking piece. In amongst the bits and bobs that never get thrown away, Gary's found the perfect addition to finish off this display piece. And that is the reverse royal cipher. Now, this would have gone on the backpack, which was black, and this was the one for the Grenadier Guards. So it's quite fitting that this should sit with this. Perfect. All that's left is to add the glass, and this incredible piece of history is complete. Well... Looks the business, really like that. From a tired and broken drum that Gary bought for £200 at auction to a beautifully restored and transformed display table that he's looking to sell for £1,200. It gives the drum some importance and gives it a pride of place. With the glass top, it means a wonderful piece of history has been preserved and uh, now has a function within the home. At the forge, Blacksmith David is working on Gary's garden feature. Having created the metal sphere, he now needs to shape an arrowhead which will pierce through the centre. His aim is to sculpt the arrow from a single piece of metal. First, he needs to choose a suitable strip to work with. 
One of the lovely things about blacksmithing is we could start with a completely inappropriate size of metal and forge it, either making it larger or smaller, uh, and ultimately shape it to what we want. The metal is heated in the half to over 800 degrees Celsius. Once it glows bright orange, David knows it's the right temperature to begin forging into shape. That's why we've all become blacksmiths. Turning one thing into a completely different other. This power hammer is used to pound the metal, where it begins to take the shape of the arrow shaft. The remaining wider section of metal is then used to create the arrow head. So I'm going to draw this out and taper it down and then start to spread it out. Once I've got it big enough for what I want, I'm going to flatten it and using the hot chisel, you're going to cut it out. And there she is. David then uses the same technique on a separate piece of metal to make the fletching. Yeah, there we go. Adding fine detail to represent the feather lines. We're getting there now. Very nearly finished. While David finishes off the arrow, his colleague Billy is adapting the tripod base to fit so that the steel figure of Atlas can be attached. I'm taking this piece of wood off to fit the figurine for the sphere, uh, and then I'll be taking off the section of metal here. Might require a little bit of tapping, it's fairly rusted. And then this section here will be crimped together uh, so that the man can fit in between nicely. Almost there. Once he's heated the mild steel to just over 1,000 degrees Celsius, he can forge it into shape. So this bar is going to be mounted in here. With him fixed on top, holding everything up. But before the piece can be assembled, David needs to fix the two sections of finished arrow into position. And then I'm going to start working my way up, drilling holes through there until I can actually slide this, the arrow through. Before welding them together and onto the sphere. Yabba -dabba -doo. All they need to do now is add the godly flourish of Atlas. Can we chuck it on and see what it looks like? Yep. As the final piece comes together, Gary's return couldn't have been better timed. Well, you have been busy. Oh, hello, Gary. <laughs> Doesn't it look, it look great? It's quite a beast, isn't it? Oh, all credit to you. That's a fantastic job. David has listened to every single thing I said, and he's interpreted my thoughts exactly. And seeing it in the flesh is just it's mind blowing. I think he's made a magnificent job. It's a, a, a real creation, it's a real piece of art. Back at the workshop, there's a few finishing touches to make before Gary's vision is complete. I have a book of uh, brass leaf here, and I want to carefully apply that onto... I'm going to do Atlas and the Fletch and the Arrowhead. 
these sections will just stand out. It's going to be a little bit of a trial and error. This is Japan oil. You apply it to the surface, let it go tacky. It's almost touch dry. Simply, you lay it onto it, then you just leave it alone. The metal work will corrode naturally. I'm not going to try and do a painted finish. I just want it to look aged like it's always been there and complements the stand. After a quick buff and polish, it's ready for display. From a decommissioned helicopter jack that Gary bought for £50 to a handcrafted spectacular garden feature. The old copper strip he salvaged from a previous armillary sphere has been perfectly incorporated as an eye-catching feature. He now hopes to sell this dramatic structure for £1,200. Atlas is supporting the world. The two pieces sit well together. I'm just really pleased with it. What a great uh, project and a piece that's got amazing presence. Just need to find a home for it now. Let's hope it ends up somewhere spectacular. I have to say, I'm not sure I want to sell it now. Might just have to go back into the, uh, the collection. Next time on Restoration Workshop. Welcome to Trinity Marine. Oh, my world, this yeah. is absolutely bonkers. Gary gets his pick of some awe-inspiring maritime memories.